tonight on CBC Vancouver News. All First Nations have the obligation and the right to make decisions within their traditional territories. Concern for hundreds of jobs and Indigenous rights as the feds plan to end open net fish farming. Why some say it's high time. You got to win a lotto. The lotto to go camping is, is pretty ridiculous. After years of crashes and glitches, BC's new camping reservation system opens, but some are still left disappointed. And the sentencing of a man caught on camera shoving an elderly Asian person in Vancouver. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Anita Bath. Well, tens of thousands of people logged on this morning to try to snag a camping spot in B.C. And while the province's new online reservation system is better than what came before it, John Hernandez is finding out there are only so many spots to go around. Oh, it's not working. It was an early morning for Angela Massey. She was on her computer at 6 a.m. jumping on a virtual queue along with some friends for some highly sought after campsites. I was 5,000 in line and yet they were like 11,500, 14,500. Um, most of us got sites today. BC's new online booking system opened today, a big upgrade over its previous one, which was known to crash when there was significant demand. We've increased server capacity. We've increased the effectiveness of the website. Uh, we're increasing capacity at particular times when we expect surges. Other features include interactive maps, calendars, and user accounts. Campers can book a site up to two months in advance. That meant plenty of competition today with tens of thousands signing on. What was a bit concerning actually when the site was actually starting to upload there was this gray bar and it just went thinking, 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 and you're like, oh, is it crashing, crashing, crashing? Massey says she was one of the lucky ones, getting a spot at Golden Ears for the May long weekend. But the same can't be said for her friend Michael Baber, whose family couldn't secure a spot at Porto Cove. It's pretty disappointing to be here in BC because it's so beautiful. But, uh, you know, you got to win a lotto. The lotto to go camping is, is pretty ridiculous, in, in my opinion, because we have the nicest backcountry in the world here. Critics say the fresh coat of paint online does little to solve the bigger issue, which is demand far outstripping supply. Mainland, we've got like 60% of the province living in the lower mainland. Um, we've got, you know, only a certain uh, number of, of parks. Uh, all sites pretty much, with the exception, of, I believe, of one park, are 100% reservable. So that means that if you don't know your schedule, you know, for the next couple of months, you, you won't be able to participate. A province known for the outdoors with only so many provincial campground spots to go around. John Hernandez, CBC News, Vancouver. It was a disturbing scene caught on camera, and today the man seen hurling racist insults and shoving an elderly Asian man in East Vancouver two years ago has been sentenced after pleading guilty to assault. Jamie Bezanson, seen here from behind, was given a conditional discharge and a year of probation. Surveillance video shows him in 2020 grabbing the arm of a 92-year-old victim and shoving him out the door of a 7-Eleven. The victim, who has Alzheimer's, fell to the ground and hit his head. He was not hurt. And in Kelowna, a man has been charged for making threats against a member of the media. Bruce Oridzuk, seen here wearing blue in this video from July, was recorded shouting racist insults at a security guard outside a Kelowna vaccine clinic. His charges, though, stem from a separate incident later that summer. He's been hit with one count of uttering threats to cause death or bodily harm against a journalist. No charges have been laid for his exchange with the security guard. An Abbotsford man has been charged with assault after he allegedly pulled a gun on an unhappy customer. Police say the victim bought several items on Facebook Marketplace before realizing some of the goods were fraudulent. He confronted the seller and demanded his money back, but the seller went to his car and allegedly pulled out a firearm, threatened the customer and fled. Police say he was later arrested, charged and released from custody. Vancouver police have blocked off Lost Lagoon tonight as they deal with what they're calling a suspicious package. Police say it was found near the footpath around the lagoon earlier today. It's not clear what the package is, but the force has called it in its emergency response team. 
Victoria police are setting up checkpoints near the B.C. legislature, deterring a convoy of anti-COVID mandate protesters who seem determined to converge on the capital. While protest vehicles are being turned away today, our Legislative Bureau reporter Mira Baines tells us they could soon be targeting another Vancouver Island community. The lawn of the B.C. legislature is clear of tents and protesters, with only a small group left this afternoon. Even so, Victoria police aren't taking any chances and have set up checkpoints at key intersections around the building and through the James Bay neighborhood. Only local traffic is allowed. Over the weekend, a loud convoy of vehicles showed up to protest vaccine mandates and mask requirements. Even though masks are no longer needed to be worn in most settings, and BC's vaccine card requirement ends April 8th. Still, protesters came, but Victoria police prevented them from crowding streets and blocking access to the legislature. In a recent video, at least one organizer complained about the limitations. What a gong show that was. So all we wanted to do was uh, go down to the ledge grounds and just have a peaceful rally and uh, head back home. But uh, I think the police were under the intentions that we were going to lock up the street or something and didn't want us down there. Still, police say they don't want a repeat of the trucker convoy in Ottawa. In Victoria, protesters are able to walk, cycle and take transit wherever they'd like to go. In between you know, the last eight weeks as well as those conflicts and additional information we have about groups coming here to do kind of an occupation style protest, we need to take the step to make sure again people are safe, but people's right to be able to have that safe, peaceful and lawful protest is also provided for. The driver of a truck which became stuck in the mud at Beacon Hill Park was fined $600 and his license plates were seized. Some residents of the area say the checkpoints are causing congestion, but many agree with their intent. Yeah, I actually just went through a checkpoint and it's, it's a little annoying and stuff, uh, but I, at the end of the day they need to keep people out from in front of Parliament and whatnot. Well, they have to be told who is uh, not in charge and they're not in charge. I mean, overall, it would be nice if the convoy just never came, um, <clears throat> but it's their right to do that. Protesters have been gathering at the legislature on weekends, but the latest security measures may have them forming a new plan. Victoria police say the checkpoints are here indefinitely. It's unclear where the next protest convoy could materialize. Mira Baines, CBC News, Victoria. It's unclear when a CN rail train that came off the tracks last night in North Vancouver will be up and running again. At least two cars containing solid sulfur toppled over in the lower Lonsdale area. No one was hurt and fire crews say there appears to be no concern for contamination. The cause of the derailment is now being investigated by the Canadian National Police Service. That's a private railroad police force that helps protect CN rail property and personnel. Well, in the midst of a historic housing shortage, the province is releasing more than 100 affordable rental units in Burnaby. People need homes like these, these 125 rental units, so they aren't forced to uh, leave their community to find suitable housing. This is on transit, it's close to shopping, you don't need to have a car, uh, and they're appropriately sized suites for all different kinds of families and individuals. The 14-story building on Sussex Avenue in Metrotown has 25 accessible units for people living with disabilities. Half the units will be rented at 70% of the market rate, the other half at 90%. The new apartments are part of a larger redevelopment that includes 324 units of market housing being developed in Burnaby. Applicants should apply to the BC Housing website. <laughs> Well, some First Nation communities say hundreds of jobs will be lost along with millions of dollars in income if the federal government doesn't reverse a decision to close open net fish farms. As Joel Ballard tells us, the farms are linked to failing wild salmon stocks accused of spreading disease and sea lice. The deadline is set. All open net fish farms need to close by 2025. But key stakeholders say they've been left out of the conversation. No longer are we going to sit idly by while people decide what's best for our territories and the people within them. A new coalition of 17 First Nations wants Ottawa to reissue salmon farming licenses for a minimum of five years, saying the industry employs 276 people while injecting $50 million into coastal Indigenous communities. And ultimately, they say discussions around the future of fish farms comes down to self-determination. 
It's our voices that need to be heard at that decision-making table, whether they're for or against or willing to work towards something that finds that, that common ground in the middle. Open net fish farms are being closed after being linked to the decimation of wild salmon stocks in BC. And so they allow the free flow of, of pathogens and sewage and lice out of the farm. Which are then introduced to wild salmon. For many, the stakes are too high because it could mean... Extinction of BC wild salmon runs, plain and simple. Last week, a separate group of 102 First Nations expressed their support for the federal government's plans, although it's a balancing act. All First Nations have the obligation and the right to make decisions within their traditional territories, no question about it. But when we talk about wild salmon, we can't pretend that salmon stay in one territory. What happens at fish farms impacts wild salmon stocks across BC, he says. With the 2025 deadline looming and current licenses set to expire, some First Nation communities want to know what the future holds. And BC Green Party MLA Adam Olson says multiple levels of government have dropped the ball when it comes to communication. Frankly, this is on the, the, from the federal government who have known this date was coming and seemingly decided to uh, let us to get here to a point where um, the important conversations with the Indigenous nations that have been involved in this clearly haven't happened. Ultimately, when it comes to conversations that affect specific First Nations, the new coalition says it deserves a seat at the table. Joel Ballard, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, dozens of supporters turned out this morning as an historic Aboriginal land title case got underway in B.C. Supreme Court. The tiny New Hatlet First Nation wants to prove its claim to hundreds of kilometres of crown land off the west coast of Vancouver Island. As Jason Proctor explains, observers are expecting a groundbreaking trial. The lawyer for the Nechatlet First Nation began his opening remarks by saying the case itself is about reconciliation, a chance for a judge to undo a historical wrong that was done nearly two centuries ago when the British claimed sovereignty over land he says belongs to his clients. The court case has been called historic because it's the first to follow in the footsteps of a precedent-setting case in 2014. At that point, the Supreme Court of Canada gave the Chilcotin First Nation Aboriginal title over more than 2,000 square kilometers of land in northern BC. The top court set a test for title that includes exclusive occupation of a piece of land in 1846, the year of a treaty that drew up the boundary between what is now Canada and the United States. The Nechatlet First Nation only has about 151 members. The crown land they're seeking Aboriginal title over consists mostly of Nootka Island. Oh, this is huge, it's monumental, and as I mentioned, we're going to prove to the entire world uh, the inherent rights and title that the new Chatlet people have never, ever surrendered. Their lawyer, Jack Woodward, told the judge hearing the case his client's ancestors met Captain James Cook in 1778, the year the British explorer sailed into Nootka Sound. The province disputes the claim, arguing the Nechatlet who were in the area when Cook arrived were a weak and small affiliation of groups who had been displaced to the area by other indigenous peoples. The trial is expected to last about 60 days, calling on historians, archaeologists and even an ethnobotanist who claims there is evidence indigenous people cultivated the land centuries ago. Woodward claims there's no question the Nechatlet have a right to Aboriginal title over some of the area. The issue to be determined in the coming months will be how much. Jason Proctor, CBC News, Vancouver. Meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff joins us on this soggy day. Uh, and Joe, <laughs> I know the rain isn't going away, but perhaps a bit of good news for tomorrow. We can definitely bring some warm temperatures into the mix, Anita. Yeah, it's rainy and cool today. And that was a story yesterday, sort of struggling around seven, eight degrees for Metro Vancouver. Uh, this plume of moisture, if you will, isn't quite done, but we're going to see southwesterly winds kick in. Let me take you to the current temperatures right now. Uh, we will feel a lot warmer than this tomorrow. Eight right now at YVR, nine out towards Hope and Squamish. I think we could add five to six degrees on top of what we're feeling today, but we do have to get through another 12 or, or so hours of the rain. Here's the radar and you can see some heavier bands still moving in across Metro Vancouver in the darker green and the yellows there. We are beginning to see things lighten up though for Metro Vancouver. 
Uh, but the showers and the forecast through the overnight watch, they take you through the midnight hour, four, five, six a.m. Rain for your Tuesday morning. So whatever your morning plans are, be prepared for a soggy one. As we head into the afternoon, though, look at this. I think just before sunset, hopefully a few hours before, a dramatic clear out. I just love it when we get behind a cold front just in time for sunset. And that's the story tomorrow. Uh, this is straight model data for tomorrow's highs. I actually think it's underplaying it. I'd go with a 14, even 15 degrees for parts of Metro Vancouver. I'll break down those temperatures uh, and we'll take a look at the first full week of spring ahead. But happy spring, Anita. Not bad. Happy spring, Johanna. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Weather update brought to you by Alegria by Cirque du Soleil. Opens March 25th at Concord Pacific Place. Well, the NHL trade deadline has come and gone, and after staying quiet for most of the day, the Canucks took action just before time ran out. They sent forward Tyler Mott to the New York Rangers and in exchange got a fourth-round pick in the 2023 draft. Mott was not expected back with the team once his contract ran out this season. When it was clear for us that, that we couldn't resign him, uh, we felt that, that we should try to maximize our, our return at, the, at this point. The trade comes after the Canucks swapped a third round pick with Toronto yesterday for defender Travis Dermott. Ukraine has rejected the Kremlin's demand to lay down weapons, refusing to surrender the besieged port city of Mariupol. While thousands remain trapped, coming up, we hear from some who have found their way to relative safety. Welcome to our commercial-free live stream. Edmonton's video game sector is flourishing, and the city's growing industry is attracting a variety of talent who bring the games to life. Stephen Cook visited a couple of studios to learn more. I like video games. That's hardly a unique trait. But some people have followed their passion to actually make them. Now, these fantastical worlds, they're made not only by programmers, but by writers, artists, and other creatives. Like Amy Correa. Concept art is a form of art that is used to convey designs, ideas, and worlds to be used in the entertainment industry. So like in video games and films. Correa has been a concept artist at Beamdog for two years. A longtime gamer herself, this is the realization of a dream. I'm still new at all of this and like my career is just starting. Um, but this is definitely where I want to be and I don't think I would have moved all the way from Sydney to here if, if it wasn't uh, my dream. Major games are now like film productions, requiring skill sets for writing, illustrating, music composition and more. People from the city are benefiting too. Yeah, it's been great that I haven't had to leave home to get into this industry. Um, programs when I was starting in school weren't as well developed as they are now, but now it's more than just one game studio in the city and it's more than just one or two schools. Duguay took the digital media and IT program at Nate and has been working at various Edmonton studios for the better part of a decade. She says those looking to join the industry need to hone a variety of skills and be willing to start small. There is a lot of rejection involved. There is a lot of um, having to stick to it and try different things within the space. You're not necessarily going to get started in AAA. Game development is an exploding industry, thought to have contributed $5.5 billion to the Canadian GDP last year. And as the local scene grows, expect more talented creatives to make a home in Edmonton. Stephen Cook, CBC News, Edmonton.
with the invasion of Ukraine now in its fourth week. Nowhere is the full horror of the war more apparent than in the city of Mariupol. Under relentless siege for three weeks now, officials say nearly 90 percent of its buildings have been damaged or destroyed. The city is almost completely cut off, making it hard to get a clear picture of what's happening. By some estimates, as many as 300,000 people are trapped in desperate need of food, water and medicine. And as Susan Ormiston explains, those who managed to escape accuse Russia of targeting civilians. <laughs> Tatiana Bulkina had her first good sleep in a month in this Lviv shelter, on the floor but warm and safe. She escaped her bombed and blackened city, Mariupol, on Friday after three harrowing weeks trapped in her basement, nearly out of water and food. But she did get out, still tormented by the siege. A horrible hell. While I was going out to find water, I saw a young man, his face burned out, leaving only his skull and his eyes. Tatiana, do you still see those images, even though you're safe here? It's impossible to forget. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you worried about those you left behind? I'm worried about everyone. I left my husband, my son, and I'm afraid they could die. Russian troops are everywhere in the city, Tatiana confirms. Soldiers' bodies lying in the streets, no one has buried them. Russia demanded Mariupol surrender by dawn Monday. That was rejected flat out by Ukraine's leaders. They can destroy the whole country and uh, kill all uh, citizens, uh, all population. That's the, uh, the way to, uh, to win. We never give up. But Russia's intent on squeezing the strategic port city, most humanitarian aid can't get in and getting out is dangerous. Ukraine accused Russia of shelling buses of evacuees again Monday, sending three children to hospital. Tatiana had 10 minutes to leave her home. She took her ID and a coat, said goodbyes to her family, and drove out with a local priest. With internet and cellular service cut, she hasn't heard from them since. And Tatiana, what do you think about the Russians who did this to your city? Idiots. They didn't spare people, children, not buildings, nothing. They don't have any humanity. She had to leave her cat behind, too. A surrogate here at the shelter is a rare comfort. Mariupol, cut off and suffering, is a crisis. 2,300 people have already died, and that number could be higher, according to local officials. The picture's still clouded by bombardment and fears that the city could fall. Susan Ormston, CBC News, Lviv. Russia's invasion has triggered a global outpouring of support for Ukraine. Countries, organizations and individuals are sending whatever they can to help. Briar Stewart has more on a group in Latvia sending vehicles loaded with supply into the war zone. The final instructions before a 15-hour drive across three countries. This journey is about a delivery. 17 cars are headed from Latvia to Ukraine for the country's territorial defense units. This one is going Nissan Navara, Ford Ranger is going. Martin Danita says all of these cars have either been donated or purchased by his garage at a deep discount. If you call, uh, call people who are selling 4x4 vehicles and you say, OK, but that's for Ukraine, so what can you do? And they say, OK, let's go, let's go for half a price. So everyone is so supportive. Dozens of vehicles have already been delivered to Ukraine near the front line. Slava Ukraini! Where roads are rough and vehicles can easily be damaged. Before they hit the road, a team of mechanics makes sure they're good to go. And valuable cargo, including gas, is loaded up. In addition to all of the cars that are being taken to Ukraine, people are coming to drop off donations to send as well. In this car, someone has brought sleeping bags, power banks to charge phones and clothing. Some not only donate their cars, but volunteer to drive them as well. Thinking also about our 
our own security and, 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 and our, our society as well. So I think, yes, of course, I need to help. And that fear is at the root of most of the volunteer effort. On this trip, a few Latvians are hitching a ride on the convoy so they can join the fight in Ukraine. Everyone knows that we are next. So, so it's as simple as that. If Russia is stopped in Ukraine, then they don't come here. As easy as that. You really believe that? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Which is why those heading down say these cars and this trip are the least they can do because this is not just about Ukraine. Briar Stewart, CBC News, near Riga, Latvia. Amid the escalating violence, a Canadian infant born to a surrogate has been rescued from Kyiv. The boy is fewer than 10 days old. <laughs> Members of an American nonprofit organization packed up little Ari and managed to get him out of harm's way. They delivered him to his parents, who had traveled from Canada to a city in western Ukraine to be united with him. The family has now safely crossed into Poland. The exodus of nearly three and a half million Ukrainian refugees is starting to overwhelm neighboring nations. And so Canada has pledged to make it quicker and easier for them to come here. But there are calls for Ottawa to speed up that process. The CBC's Salima Shivji has more on that from Warsaw, Poland. This is a city that is buckling under the strain of hundreds of thousands of refugees, Ukrainians who have crossed the border into Poland and ended up in the capital city here. Warsaw has some 300,000 new arrivals. That's about uh, more than the population of Windsor, Ontario. It, it's uh, made the population of Warsaw, this capital city, jump by about 20 percent. And that means there are long lines uh, outside community centers uh, giving out free food, long lines at, at uh, documentation centers uh, where refugees are trying to get their identity papers in order. Uh, there are also a lot of these refugees that want to move Move on to different countries. There's a long line right here. Uh, we're outside of the Canadian embassy here in Warsaw, and these are all Ukrainian refugees who are waiting to get their biometrics done, basically fingerprinting and photos uh, to make the visa process a little bit easier so that they're able to go to Canada uh, to meet up with family or, or friends. So they are waiting for these appointments, uh, sometimes all day in line here. A lot of people wondering what is happening, how long the processing time will take until they are finally able to make it into Canada. And earlier today, I did speak with the mayor of Warsaw, who was talking about the burden on his city and how city officials are really scrambling uh, to help all of the refugees, uh, to deal with the influx of people and he called on more Western countries to do more. I've talked to Justin Trudeau myself when he was in Warsaw and he promised support and I know that Canada is open to Ukrainian uh, refugees. You have one of the biggest Ukrainian diasporas in the world so I welcome that uh, and simply I would simply say as quickly as possible and with minimum uh, red tape. No, minimum red tape is his ask and there is an urgency here. The biggest movement of refugees across Europe in decades and the message from Warsaw's mayor, he can't do it alone. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Warsaw. The federal government is facing growing pressure to get Canadian Pacific trains rolling again. Just two days into a work stoppage, both sides deny triggering. It's hitting across the country, including right here in B.C. Karen Paul shows us what happens when more than 3,000 conductors, engineers and other workers are off the job. These parents recently welcomed the seventh generation of their farm family, even as fears are mounting about their future. It's scary because, yeah, it is one more thing, one more stress to add to a, a farmer, um, specifically here in the prairies where we depend very highly on our rail service. Um, we, we need to get our crops to market. So if we can't get that to our customers, that's a big problem for us here in our small little town. Although less than two days old, the CP work stoppage is yet another logistical blow to an already fragile system. Before the labor dispute, CP was moving almost 49,000 rail cars every week. It's the most critical uh, mode of delivery in, in the country. 
which means it's a growing concern here amid calls for back-to-work legislation. So what will the government do to immediately address this situation? The Labour Minister acknowledging the timing is terrible. Canada's supply chains are still reeling from the B.C. floods from COVID-19 and now a Russian invasion of Ukraine. I am here in Calgary. I am urging the parties to reach an agreement. Not everyone is in favour of government intervention. Instead, there should be pressure applied on the employer to return to the negotiating table and to work out a deal with workers. But industry and farm groups are calling on the government to take quick and decisive action to end this dispute. This could be the most devastating thing that we've seen. As he checks on his barley, this farmer is torn. Luckily, we live in a place like Canada where people do have the right to strike and the, the right for workers to stand up for a better living wage, and I support that as well. Negotiations are ongoing with the help of a federal mediator. Neither side is talking about the progress, but there's no doubt they're feeling the pressure too. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Winnipeg. For some young learners, a large part of their lives has been dominated by the pandemic. Coming up, what some Canadian parents say have been the most challenging aspects of raising kids during COVID and how their children have surprised them. Vancouver fans call this the grizzly roar. But it's often more of a whimper these days. Hard to muster up much enthusiasm when a city's hoop dreams are about to be shattered. It doesn't look good. I enjoy every game I come to, so it's pretty sad. If all goes according to plan by season's end, the Grizzlies are gone. With the NBA's blessing, the American owner wants to move his American players to an American city. And it's all about making big American bucks. When he bought the team last year, Michael Heisley saw things differently. I intend to do everything in my power to make this franchise a success in Vancouver. That was before he figured his losses would run over $60 million this season. Now Heisley is shopping for a new home. I know that people are disappointed with me in Canada. Starting with his six-time season ticket holder. It makes me feel like we have uh, been somewhat cheated. David Nelson hopes to save the Grizzlies by hunting Heisley down with lawyers. He's suing for what he calls false representation. Uh, this city's not been given a chance from day one. The team has been a consistent loser, with one of the worst records of any franchise in NBA history. They've never had the right owner, never had the right manager, never had the right coach, never had the right players, never formed a connection with the community. And it's very fragile here. The, the economics don't work at the best of times. Now there are fresh rumours of a local consortium jumping in to save the Grizzlies, but fans have no guarantee the owner will accept. As for the game, well, the Grizzlies stayed true to form. They lost. Christina Lewan, CBC News, Vancouver. Over the weekend, 6,500 tons of herring were caught in a 39-hour blitz, a very brief season for fishermen who needed a cash bonanza to get out of debt. And when you see the fish cascading into bins, it looks and smells like prosperity. But in this case, looks are definitely deceiving. Today's postmortem, a mediocre catch at best. And for John Bunn, it just wasn't enough. Well, yeah, I consider myself a casualty. Bunn is 30 years old, 15 years in the business, and $130,000 in debt. Crippling interest rates, rising fuel costs, and falling fish prices have caused him to give his boat back to the bank. The people I feel sorry for are the people with the houses and the wives and the kids. The banks are reluctant to repossess because there's virtually no resale market for fish boats. Nevertheless, one fisherman took off for Costa Rica, trying to hide from his banker till things turned around. And he thought he might sell the vessel to people involved in the drug trade, and then when the U.S. Marshals seized that he'd buy it back from them. But when the poor fisherman realized his mortgage would still be outstanding even if he got his boat back, he gave up the idea and is on his way home a very unhappy man. Jerry Thompson, CBC News, Vancouver.
Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. It was a disturbing scene caught on camera, and today the man seen hurling racist insults and shoving an elderly Asian man in East Vancouver two years ago has been sentenced. Jamie Bezanson has been given a conditional discharge and a year of probation. Police in North Van say they do not yet know when a derailed train will be up and running again. The CN train went off the track last night in Lower Lonsdale with at least two cars containing solid sulfur. The mineral is used in household and industrial products. And tens of thousands of campers logged on this morning to book a campsite on the province's new reservation system. You can now book sites up to two months in advance for most provincial parks. The redesign comes after a series of mishaps related to BC's previous online service in seasons past, including website crashes and system errors. To COVID-19 now, BC is reporting another drop in hospitalizations. 19 fewer patients in hospital since Friday, but at least three more have been admitted to critical care. Eight more people have died over the past three days. And starting today, British Columbians aged 30 and older are eligible to pick up rapid test kits at pharmacies. Well, most kids in B.C. have been back in the classroom for quite a while. And according to a new survey by the Angus Reid Institute in partnership with the CBC, the time spent at home learning remotely has been tough for many parents. Chris O'Neill Yates has more on the findings. This survey says the past two years have been tough on Canadian children and their parents in terms of mental health and physical health. Hit worst are people in low income bracket with poor access to health care, especially the immunocompromised and new Canadians. Seven in 10 parents said remote learning had been difficult for them and their kids, especially those with children from 6 to 17. And that really stands out in this survey. The extent to which parents feel frustration. Two out of three felt that decision makers have not been listening to parents and let them and their children down. It was very much a yo-yo of openings and closings and extended breaks and, and Christmas school closing uh, for longer, Christmas breaks being extended, etc. Through all of that, parents have not only had to navigate, what am I going to do with the kids through this time if I'm back to work or if I'm working from home, but also, are my children actually getting the knowledge that they need to be cramming into their little heads? But on a positive note, Curl says children have been showing amazing resilience throughout the pandemic and they've had good support networks to help them navigate and their parents to navigate the past two years. That's how Amy Grace feels. She says it's been tough in many ways, but her six year old daughter is doing fine. I also think too, uh, this is not the first time, this is not, the, we're not the first generation to deal with something like this. And we're not the first group of people to have to suffer because there's something going on in the world. And of course, we probably have not seen the end of the kinds of restrictions and changes that parents and kids will have to adapt to. Chris O'Neill Yates, CBC News, Halifax. In addition to the challenges faced during the pandemic, many post-secondary students now have to contend with soaring tuition fees. Deanna Sumanak johnson has this report on how the rising cost of education is affecting student lives outside the classroom. Dane Monkman says he's luckier than most. The tuition for his graduate program is up to $8,000 a year, funded by his band, the Pegwis First Nation. Even with a part-time job, it's still difficult to make ends meet. We're usually going to buy in bulk from places like Costco, um, getting meals prepared for the full week at a time, uh, and even, you know, trying not to go out and spend anything at all on uh, sort of entertainment purposes. In other cities, rent is so high, some students like Yasmin Gardi have to turn to food banks for help. And I live in a one bedroom apartment and my rent is 1700 per month. On top of living expenses, tuition costs are set to rise again this year for both domestic and international students. And those from abroad are limited in how much they can work in Canada. So I'm maintaining my, my schedule at only 20 hours a week. It's not enough to maintain yourself. Um, it's definitely it's, not it's enough. It's at a fast food place? Yeah, it's at a fast food place, um, so I'm getting paid minimum wage. 
Tuition for this New Yorker attending college in Canada, close to $20,000 a year for courses that are all online. Rent for his shared basement apartment, additional $12,000 a year. Nowadays, most people my generation that I speak to, none of us really have any expectation of actually owning a home. That's one of the reasons Dane Monkman is working with Canadian Federation of Students to lobby for a freeze on tuition increases, more scholarships and bursaries, or to forgive student loans. That sort of debt that hangs over students or becomes a barrier for entry for students is really hard to deal with and certainly keeps some students out completely. So that he, the first generation of his family to attend university, isn't the last. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. A joint operation involving three levels of law enforcement has been trying to freeze about a million dollars in cryptocurrency raised for the so-called Freedom Convoy in Ottawa. But a CBC investigation has found that more than 70 percent of the assets appear to have evaded seizure so far. David Fraser has more on how the money is being moved. In various live streams and self-made videos, Nicholas St. Louis walks from truck to truck in downtown Ottawa, handing out envelopes, telling drivers how to cash out Bitcoin donations to the Freedom Convoy. Oh, nice. Remember how I came and gave you some sats? Yep, yep. There's eight grand of Bitcoin in there. Oh, in here? In there. St. Louis has not been charged for his actions in the protest, and he declined to speak with CBC. But according to his own affidavit from a separate civil case, police officers searched his home two weeks later, seizing $250,000 worth of Bitcoin. In total, authorities seem to have recovered less than 30% of the roughly $1 million in cryptocurrency donations since the federal government invoked the Emergencies Act a month ago. Crypto wallets have been shared by the RCMP with financial institutions and accounts have been frozen. The act authorized the freezing of convoy assets, but CBC's own blockchain research reveals large amounts of funds continue to be moved in the days after. In one example, a main account containing 15 bitcoins was emptied into a secondary wallet. It was then used as an intermediary to disperse smaller increments into 101 different wallets. And just like that, more than $700,000 worth of Bitcoin appears to have evaded capture. People even boast about it on the internet. The, the freeze orders themselves are, are, are personally, I think, are of limited practical value. Crypto lawyer Matthew Burgoyne says police face an uphill battle in their investigation. And it's so easy for someone to uh, transfer cryptocurrency from wallet to wallet, peer to peer, in a way that doesn't involve um, cryptocurrency exchanges that are regulated in a way that it doesn't involve financial institutions. The RCMP won't confirm or deny any investigation, but says it does have the capacity to recover crypto assets and use a variety of police procedures to tackle crypto crime. David Fraser, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, crypto isn't the only digital marketplace captivating speculators and profit seekers. What you should know about the real estate boom happening in the metaverse. Coming up. And at 643, a live look down a wet Georgia street, downtown Vancouver. A little sunshine to look forward to after we get just a bit more rain. Johanna has your full weather update next. Rodgers and Hammerstein are uh, two legends of uh, musical theater. They created uh, so many inventions and innovations in the genre that, uh, that makes them legendary and uh, their songs are just so incredibly beautiful. The lyrics uh, and of course the orchestration. I gotta get ready before she comes. I gotta make sure that, that she... It's the tunes. It's like, it's such beautiful tunes that they wrote and, and music is, is lush and gorgeous. It's a very special sound 
uh, that we don't play all the time. Uh, this It's a 1950s, 1960s orchestra sound, Broadway, and these are the full orchestrations, which don't often get performed. A lot of times when the when they're in the pit, the orchestra's in the pit, it's a smaller, more pared down version of the music, but this is the full sort of most extravagant version that Rodgers and Hammerstein ever created. The energy in the room is, fen is phenomenal. I mean, everybody's, it's, it's, it's great to be back. We're all, uh, it's, you know, Julian's great to work with Maestro uh, Pelicano. He's just a ph phenomenal, and uh, it's been a real joy to, to be back in Winnipeg singing. It's the melody, and that's often the case with music that stands the test of time, is that uh, the melodies are just so beautiful and inventive and natural that we can't help kind of getting them stuck in our, in our ears. Uh, but at the same time, it's the, um, the lyrics, the subject matter, um, the ideas that they, what they were trying to do through their musicals that makes them so important and also um, so much so well loved. Some people may really like have seen these before and, and, and know them, and th th that's kind of the nerve-wracking part about doing pieces that people really know, is because they, they're going to be mouthing the words with me. <laughs> Let's hope the words come out, out of my mouth the right way. In the year 2050, how will BC look? From agriculture to cities, how will climate change change life? Don't miss 2050, Degrees of Change, a CBC Vancouver original podcast, now available. There are warnings about a risky new trend in real estate. People spending big money on land that doesn't actually physically exist. It's in something called the metaverse. Alison Northcott explains how it works and who's buying in despite the risk. Cosmos in Montreal offers up a classic diner experience. Lots of greasy food and endless cups of coffee. Now, owner David Minicucci wants to bring this place into the virtual world. With a friend who might be in another city, and you both order the food at the same time while wearing the VR headset, and you kind of enjoy it together in this immersive Cosmos experience. Show me where your parcel of land is. So basically, you can see it's there are coordinates. This is the virtual land he recently purchased in the metaverse, an immersive network of online worlds just starting to take shape. When we have our virtual replica of the restaurant, are people going to interact in the same way? Are they going to interact with our employees in the same way? Are they going to come there for a good discussion? Is that sort of a patent type of purchase? Minicucci bought his plant in Decentraland, one of several digital worlds for the equivalent of about 15,000 Canadian dollars in cryptocurrency. What is the metaverse? And he's not the only one willing to spend money on land that doesn't exist in the physical world. How much did you spend on that? Two and a half million US approximately. Andrew Kegel's Toronto company is betting big on the metaverse. Our calculated bet is that as more people congregate in these environments, as these environments evolve and become more social media, gaming, music, all these areas that it's disrupting, we will have exclusive access to those parcels. 
the largest brands in the world. Kegel sees the metaverse as a new frontier for digital advertising, and this month his company will host a virtual fashion week on their property in Decentraland's fashion district. Some envision virtual spaces where your avatar can shop, visit an art gallery, or go to concerts with friends. You could rhyme off all the different potential great things that could happen with it. It's just that we're far, far from it. That's even with companies like Facebook, recently rebranded as Meta, delving in. But amid the hype, there's also plenty of skepticism, uncertainty, and little regulation. It's either pure, pure speculation and gambling, and more power to you if you know that's what it is, or it's a very, very risky um, investment to something happening in the future. If you could be at the office without the commute. The connection to cryptocurrencies, experts say, adds more risk. Still, Minakuchi is eager to see it evolve. It's like any entrepreneurial venture, you're, you're not 100% sure. And says he's already working to build his virtual restaurant on his virtual land. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Maybe I'm stuck in an old time, but I just don't quite get it. <laughs> I know, Anita, there's there's nothing like going to a restaurant or watching a concert in person. That's a tough one to get behind. Mm -hmm. But then I was thinking virtual storm chasing maybe could oh, be interesting. Okay. Yeah. Maybe you're uh, onto something. Maybe you're you got the next yes. big thing. <laughs> Copyright this immediately. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, we'll stay tuned for that one. But Anita, I've got some real storm chasing I want to take us to right now. Actually down and through Texas. Take a look at the radar right now. I know I don't usually start off in Texas, but uh, these line of severe storms happening now, a tornado outbreak uh, in through northern Texas. We've had at least a dozen reports of tornadoes on the ground, and there are still currently tornado warnings in place. Everyone under yellow, the tornado watch, uh, lots of reports of significant damage across Texas tonight. And this is night one of three nights of severe weather south of the border. So we'll be following that over the next couple of nights. Uh, it's an early time of the year for a spring severe outbreak. Uh, back up into our neck of the woods. We've got some warnings, very different story though. Uh, Terrace uh, over towards uh, Stewart, Kitimat, rainfall warnings in place, Prince Rupert as well. Uh, looking at 10 to 20 millimeters tonight, another 70 millimeters tomorrow. And I'll show you why in just a moment. I've also got the severe wind warning in place. That's a marine warning uh, for the Strait of Georgia, but wanted to keep that on anyway. Uh, as a heads up for tomorrow, we could be looking at 90 kilometer per hour winds. Heads up if you were thinking of a crossing uh, on the ferry, we'll be watching that. Uh, this is the big picture, an atmospheric river uh, hitting the south coast right now. And so the top end of that is what's bringing the severe weather. Uh, we will see the passage of this front tomorrow. Watch as they take you through the rainfall totals, maybe another 10 to 20 millimeters from Metro Vancouver overnight tonight through Tuesday morning before we get to the other side of this. Take a look at Kelowna's forecast temperature for tomorrow. Parts of the Okanagan could hit to the mid to high with that strong southwesterly flow. Showers in the morning, clearing in the afternoon. It's a one-day taste of summer, dare I say, before things cool back down to seasonal. We will see that spring test tomorrow, 13, 14, 15 across Metro Vancouver. Sunshine in the late afternoon. Showers lingering through Wednesday. It's Thursday and Friday. We're looking at two back-to-back -back seasonal spring-like days. At this point, rain returns for Saturday morning. Hopefully we'll get some sunshine Sunday and Monday. It has been a cool and wet spring, I've got to admit, looking at the numbers, we are below seasonal, but Anita, uh, the 13 tomorrow will feel good. And I'm glad we have a couple back to back sunny days. Definitely, and uh, you stayed true to your word and you pulled out the leather jacket today, very nice. Thank you for noting. Yes, we get like six days a year. I am not wasting one of them. All right. I, I got to get mine out of the closet tomorrow. You do. You do. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. You're welcome. Celebrities share their spotlight with Ukrainians, shining a light on the conflict and raising millions to help civilians under threat of invasion. That's next. I really like how you just, there's no boundaries to where you can take your animation. It was fun, but intimidating. Its possibilities are endless. If you can imagine it, you can, you can animate it. You draw all the frames and then when you play it, it's like, oh wow, <laughs> it moves, <laughs> it's good. 
my own profession is an animator, so that's kind of my uh, example that I would be working with. So before diving into kind of creating this masterclass and look that film PP I would have and package, I'm kind of doing a pilot course. So I did a 12 week animation course that I taught online. Delivery um, of education and training has been hard to do in a physical space and in close contact. So we've developed and started working on our remote delivery of programs and this 2D animation was one of the programs that we did. And the software was also free, which was great. So it didn't feel like, you know, you were committing too much um, if you weren't gonna be very good at it. <laughs> the first exercise was a, a, a bouncing ball Everybody was in the same boat. We were like you know, watching our first animations of a bouncing ball bounce across the screen. And we were like, it's magic. This is, this is so incredible. From something simple like that, we dive into a little bit more complexity. I wanted to kind of test them and see how far they can go. She demystified the whole process and um, everybody ended up producing stuff. So that bodes well on Teresa's teaching. We provided um, mini tablets for the students to borrow and take with them. They come with like a stylus so that you can draw and have a little more control. They're, they're really good with things like, you know, the pressure on the screen. And I enjoyed it more than I thought I was going to. It was like a, a, a big grown up playing with crayons, a coloring book at the end of it, only it was uh, your tablet and your computer screen. And then I made sure that the course was kind of centered around um, accessibility. Meeting with the, the 2D animation group was um, kind of gets you out of that isolation funk and um, you end up being productive and creative and social. I'm very grateful. It's an incredible feeling to support and to encourage someone who has put their time and passion into something that they believe in. We would really like to help them and help them move to the next step. That is, that is our goal, day in and day out. We always need more creativity. We need more people who can come up with innovative ideas, who can represent and tell a story, right? Um, I don't think we'll ever lack <laughs> that compartment of skill set. So the more, the merrier, you know? In the weeks since Russia's invasion, fundraisers for Ukraine have gained major momentum. We've seen efforts here in B.C. to raise money and send life-saving goods and medical supplies overseas. But now millions are rolling in for charities spearheaded by celebrities. Lindsay Duncombe looks at some of the creative efforts to support a country under attack. Hi, everyone. This is the changing face of celebrity activism. Retired soccer player and megastar David Beckham handed over his Instagram stories to the head of a perinatal hospital in Ukraine. She shows how babies are cared for in the basement between air raid sirens. There's a link to donate to UNICEF. Actor Mila Kunis, who was born in Ukraine, and her husband Ashton Kutcher have launched their own fundraising campaign, raising more than $34 million U.S. Our collective effort will provide a softer landing for so many people as they forge ahead into their future of uncertainty. The couple earned a personal thank you from President Vladimir Zelensky himself. Celebrities becomes the leaders, really drawing the whole world's attention to the message they want to send out. Social media brings people into celebrities' lives, a cultivated intimacy that increases their power to connect and persuade. Take Arnold Schwarzenegger's direct appeal to Russians. The strength and the heart of the Russian people have always inspired me. And that is why I hope that you will let me tell you the truth about the war in Ukraine and what is happening there. The former governor of California shared his own family experience with war and his ties to the country. There are traditional celebrity appeals too. Singer Camila Cabello is joining Ed Sheeran and others for a fundraising concert broadcast live across Britain. 
and The Clash gave a Ukrainian punk band permission to rework their song, London Calling, to be a lament for Ukraine's capital and a call to action. In an ever more connected world, these calls have growing reach as celebrities use their star power to help bring relief. Lindsay Dencombe, CBC News, Vancouver. That's it for CBC Vancouver News on this Monday. We're back tomorrow and appreciate you joining us. Have a wonderful night.